parable of the sower and the seed. And uh, we're going to look at this on Sunday, on Sunday morning. Uh, but basically, he tells us that uh, the Word of God was scattered, uh, but not everyone received it. Some it hit on hard ground. Uh, it didn't penetrate their heart, didn't go anywhere. Others, uh, it sprung up for a moment, but choked out by uh, thorns and different things, or had no root in themselves. Uh, some received the word, but Jesus puts very clearly that not everyone is going to receive the word of God. That this is a reality. Those, uh, Peter tells us in 2 Peter 2, uh, 3, 16, and he's talking about Paul's letters here. He says, Paul was speaking those things in his letters. Some of his comments were hard to understand, and those who are ignorant and unstable have twisted his letters to mean something quite different, just as they do with other parts of the scriptures. This will result in their destruction. In the original Greek, uh, that word twisted literally means to torture the scriptures. They're literally twisting them and torturing them. It's painful. It's destructive to their lives. We've seen this uh, in our modern day. You don't have to go that far to see people either reject or twist the word of God. That they ignore what the Bible says because of their feelings, because of their opinions, because of their politics. The dangerous thing is when you reject the Word of God, many times you'll get what you asked for, but you won't like what you get. The Bible tells us of the children of Israel that they had rejected the Word of God, the children of Israel rejected the Word of God, and God sent them. They were complaining about the manna, so He sent them quail, and they filled their nostrils and it eventually killed them. There was leanness, leanness in their soul. There was something lacking in their spiritual life because of their rejection of what God said. God will give you what you want sometimes or let you have what you want, but you won't want what you get. Secondly, people will suffer unnecessarily. Leanness in your soul, rejecting the Word of God. You know, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. When we disobey God, that's exactly what we're doing. We're trying something. We're trying it our own way. We're convinced life can work better if I'm in control rather than the Word of God, rather than what Scripture says. Therefore, I can do what I... And you suffer needlessly. You suffer. I have seen this in many areas of life. People who suffered needlessly. I had a young girl come to me in Prescott when I was uh, on staff there, and she, she's telling me she's not paying her tithe. And so I'm, I'm listening to this, and uh, she's telling me that her car's broken, she's not getting any hours at work, she's not, you know, nothing's going right for her. And I said, well, why don't you pay your tithe and let God help you? Actually, she told me all these things, and I asked her if she was tithing, she said no. I said, you need to pay your tithe. She came to me about, no, oh, two months later, she says, you know what, someone gave me a car, uh, I got a raise at work, I got more hours at work, uh, and God just really began to bless her life. She ended up, she's married today, and God has really helped her because she began to obey God. You suffer needlessly, and you're left to your own strengths when you disobey God, your own ability. You're on your own. It's a kind of a frightening thing when you're out there by yourself. When you don't know and you don't have the strength or the wisdom and all of that to navigate through life. And you're trying to do it without the Word of God. You're left. It's a scary place. Second Thessalonians tells us that God will use every kind of, uh, he, that he rather will use every kind of usable deception to fool those who are on their way to destruction because they love 
because they refuse to love and accept the truth that would save them. God says, okay, you want to believe a lie? Go ahead. This is speaking about the Antichrist. You want to believe that? No problem. It's to your own destruction because you refuse to believe the truth. So Paul writes to the Thessalonians. He's rather excited about this because they received the word of God. They took it not as man's word, not as an opinion or a philosophy, but as what God has said. 1 Thessalonians 1, 8 through 10 says, And now the word of the Lord is ringing out from you people everywhere, even beyond Macedonia and Archaea. For wherever we go, we find people telling us about your faith in God. We don't need to tell them anything about it. For they keep talking about the wonderful people you gave us and how they, you turned from, uh, away from idols to serve the living and true God. And they speak of you looking forward to the coming of God's Son from heaven, Jesus, whom God raised from the dead, and he is the one who rescued us from terror of the judgment to come. A couple of things, when you receive the word of God, it's evident there's some change in your life. It becomes an evident in your behavior, in how you look at sin, how you look at God. There's an evidence of that. That's what he tells them. Repentance is a marked, it literally means, it's the word metanoia, it literally means to change your mind. What's very interesting about it, it also means to change your direction. That you were heading one way, doing one thing, and now you've turned and you're doing a different thing and heading a different way. They had turned from their idolatry. This would have involved immorality. This would have involved all sorts of pagan worship that they turned from, and now they're serving the living God. And this is a mark. People see this. Not only this, he says, and waiting. You're anticipating the return of Jesus Christ. They speak how you look forward to the coming of God's Son. This is faith. We're looking forward to what God is going to do. We're looking forward to the future God has for us. That's faith. The marks of people who receive the word of God. One man said, if you want to please God, then you have to line up with God's word. And so the question becomes, what does God say? It's very interesting here, Paul, how grateful Paul is about this. He's grateful. He says, I thank God for this. I'm so grateful. Our text uh, literally says that uh, I never stop thanking God. The picture there of him uh, seeing what God is doing in these people's lives was so, caused Paul to rejoice. And we know that in Luke 15, Jesus says that in the same way there is more joy in heaven over one lost sinner that repents than over 99 others who are righteous and have never strayed. Another fact of the Word of God is you will then like what God likes and be excited for what God's excited about. It's just a mark of people who, if God is pleased, God rejoices in a sinner that gets saved. He rejoices in a repentive heart. He rejoices when someone starts doing right. That's an exciting moment for God. 1 Thessalonians 2, 3 and 4. So you see that we were not preaching with any deceit or impure motives or trickery. For we speak the message approved by God to be entrusted with the good news. Our purpose is to please God, not people, who alone examines the motives of the heart. You got to imagine, too, this is Paul rejoicing in his labors. 
you know, 